Happy Sabbath, everybody. Welcome to our broadcast uh, once again. Today, August 15th, is a, a very hot day. Uh, I want to make sure that you guys stay home safely and drinking lots of water. But tonight, uh, today, uh, we are um, uh, celebrating a beautiful Sabbath, and uh, our topic for today is entitled The Shepherd's Way. Uh, before we go into the, into the topic of today, uh, however, I would like to pray but I would like to pray for two families. I, I have chosen two families, one from each church, uh, from the Qualinga Church. I've chosen the, Be the Bird family, uh, Steve and Shirley, and the rest of their, of their family, although they're far away apart, you know, from, in different countries, but we'll pray for them, and uh, may the Lord be with you guys. Uh, also from the Lamore Church, we're praying for the Love family. Yes, we have a family name, the Love family. That is Stanley Love, our brother that we really love and care for, uh, of our church, one of the deacons. And uh, we'll pray for him and his immediate family. So uh, these are the two names that I bring to the table today uh, so that we can pray for them. And if he can do so as well uh, thro throughout the week and pray for these two families, the Berg and the Love families. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to come together once again. As we do, O oh Lord, we ask that a special blessing may be upon each family of our churches, O oh Lord, uh, that we may be uh, able to influence others with the gospel, that we may be, O oh Lord, empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring the gospel. Uh, bless the, the Bear family in um, Qualinga, and uh, bless them and empower them and give them healing and say. Uh, and safety and protection and your love and, and your care, O oh Lord. And uh, we ask that um, as a couple that they will be uh, uh, in a special way blessed by you. Uh, we also pray for Stanley Love and his family. Uh, be with him, O oh Lord. Uh, encourage him and protect him as well. And we're so thankful for both families that we're praying today. They are uh, really involved in your ministry in church, in both churches. And we ask that you pay them with uh, many, many blessings. Thank you, O Lord, as we open the scriptures. Speak to me and to everyone who will be listening to my voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today, um, I'm speaking about the shepherd's way. Uh, I invite you this uh, Wednesday to continue to in, tuning in to our series, The Son of God, based on the book of John. And uh, it's getting, you know, exciting, uh, you know, the study. We, we're going to be studying about the hint, a hint of uh, death that's coming up this week. So I invite you to tune in on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Today I begin by saying that in geographical and topographical circles, one cannot have a valley without mountains. In fact, a clear definition of a valley suggests this. A definition of valley says a low area of land between hills or mountains. In Psalm 23, we have the valley of today's study. In Psalm 23, 4, we read, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So you see here, uh, uh, David talks about a valley where he's in there, uh, walking, and he calls it the valley of the shadow of the death. Now, if, you, if we have this valley mentioned here in Psalm 23, my question is, should there be a mountain on both Psalm 22 and Psalm 24? I'm just curious. I'm using my geographical imagination, so I would like to know uh, if that is a true, uh, as a true statement. Uh, let's investigate the scriptures and see what we can find this beautiful Sabbath. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 22, Psalm 22, and uh, as you search for it, let me give you a heads up. Uh, the reality is that uh, neither term mountain or hill appears whatsoever in this chapter 22. So the question is, uh, you know, is it then why are you talking about this topic? Well, let's see. Let's see if, uh, if we find a mountain in chapter 22, although the specific terms are not mentioned. Uh, I would like to call to your, your attention the following passage, Psalm 22, and I'm going to read verses 16 through 18. Psalm 22, uh, verses 16 through 18, and I read, Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. 
I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. And you say, Pastor, there's nothing about a mountain here. Well, think again. Look at the first two phrases. Dogs have surrounded me, and a band of evil men has encircled me. This is what happened to Jesus at Gethsemane. Now, Gethsemane, Gethsemane was located right at the western foot of Mount, the Mount of Olives, which is on the eastern side of Jerusalem. So uh, Jesus was praying that night, and you know what happened. You know that uh, uh, Judas came with a, a, a group of soldiers, and a group of Jews, and they uh, arrested Jesus. And you know what happened? This is what Jesus uh, is talking about here, that he inspired David to write. Now, David wrote this thousand years before. So uh, listen to this. Dark surrounded me, and a band of evil men encircled me. And this came through uh, that night when Judas, uh, uh, you know, sold Jesus. Now it says then, they have pierced my hands and my feet. Where, where did that happen? At the cross, right? And then they count my bones, right? Jesus' bones were not broken. People will stare at him and gloat over him. And then they would divide his garment. Where would that happen? At Mount Golgotha. So you see, not only one mountain is mentioned here, but rather two mountains are mentioned here. Now this mountain on Psalm 22 verses 16 through 18, it's all about or are all about Jesus, both of them, about his life, about his faithfulness, even in the midst of temptation, about his commitment to you and I, uh, in spite of our pride, of our stubbornness, about, you know, uh, of our re uh, rejection of him. It is all, these mountains are all about cruci his cruc crucifixion and all uh, about the extreme abuse that he endured the piercing of both hands and feet, uh, the pulling of the beer of his face, uh, the, you know, the, the 39 lashes, uh, the, the spitting, the hitting, the mockery, all the way to the cross, you know, uh, what Jesus experienced. So uh, this has to do with his abuse, uh, extreme abuse. It was all about exposure, uh, an exhibition like if he would be something, like, you know, like, like some kind of, of a thing, Right. Uh, when in reality, he was the creator of the universe. He was the king of the universe. So in Psalm 22, there's not a single mention of a mountain or a hill, yet there are not one but two mountains implied here. The Mount of Olives from whence uh, the, he took the ultimate decision to go forward to, uh, for his sacrifice on our behalf and from where Judas brought the soldiers uh, to arrest him. In, in John chapter 18, verses 1 to 3, we read, When he had finished praying, Jesus left uh, with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. Now he was at the temple. He prayed with them. And then that night he crossed uh, the Kidron Valley uh, using the eastern gate of the city of Jerusalem. And then he went up into the Gethsemane, into the Mount of Olives uh, Valley. Uh, on the other side, there was an olive grove, right? Right at the foot of the Mount of Olives. And he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove, grove guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. And they apprehended Jesus, right? Uh, this is a place. This is a moment. He was right at the Mount of Olives. Uh, so very interestingly enough, this is a place where, where he had prayed before, right? The Gethsemane experience where he had prayed before and blood came out of, uh, right? of, uh, out of his uh, sweat and uh, eyes, right? Now, the Mount of Olives, like you can see here, uh, looking from Jerusalem east, uh, you see where that church on the left is, that's where the Gethsemane Garden is, where the uh, olive gro grove is found. And this is where they took Jesus from. Now, uh, the Mount of Golgotha, from whence uh, he executed his plan of salvation to the fullest. Uh, Jesus' ordeal is an example that no one is exempt from the wages of sin, which is death, according to Romans 6.23. Jesus at Golgotha, 
was not only the foundation and identity of Christianity, but also the model of its own demise. What I mean with that? Well, it is true that Jesus' death suffices. However, his ordeal will become the standard treatment of faithful Christians worldwide throughout the ages. The early Christian church, for example, was persecuted. Stephen was stoned to death, such uh, as, as, uh, you know, as those that experienced persecution as well and left uh, Jerusalem persecuted, oppressed. Even some of them were killed. All of them experienced this mistreatment just like Jesus did. Perhaps this morning there's someone listening who is really struggling to deal with his or her misery. Perhaps you're tired of the oppression you're going through, of the rejection, of the injustices in your life. Well, I have news for you this morning. Look at what Peter mentioned regarding experiencing similar treatment as Jesus did. And this is found in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. Let me tell you, dear church and those of you listening to me, this is probably one of the most powerful passages when you are really struggling. And I tell you, I, I, I say so because I, that was my experience. I was struggling with an issue. And this passage, is, this passage really, really served me well. And I hope that it served you well this morning. It reads, verse 12, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the Holy Spirit of glory and of God, of God rests upon you. Verse 15, if you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment, for, for it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not, do not obey the gospel of God. What a powerful statement by Peter, who was one of the disciples right there when Jesus was taken. You know the story. He's saying it is a privilege to go through the valley of the shadow of the death. It is an honor to be mocked. It's an honor to be hit. It's an honor to, be, to suffer what Jesus suffered. If you are suffering as a Christian, if you are not suffering as a Christian, then you are in real trouble. But it is a blessing. It sounds contradictory, but it is, you know, it's an amazing thing. The torment, the afflictions that the church of the first three centuries experienced became a torment, physical and mental, suffering for the many centuries to come. The nightmare of the dark ages where, where many were drowned or burnt alive or beheaded, thrown into the animals, you know, the Spanish Inquisition where many were forced to, uh, by torture to recant of their Christianity. The religious persecution that, that uh, forced Puritans from Europe uh, in, during the centuries, 16th and 17th centuries, to, to flee Europe and settle in here in America. Before there was a valley, there's a mountain. So we all have to go through it. Before you suffer all kinds of injustices, our Lord Jesus went through them. Now, that being said, we have a mountain on Psalm 22, verses 16 through 18. Hence, let us investigate about this valley found in Psalm 23. Let us turn to Psalm 23. We're going to read verses 1 through 4, and I read, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down, lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters, quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk in the sh in, uh, through the valley of the shadow of the death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What a powerful passage. 
In John chapter 10, uh, as we have seen before, Jesus is described as the good shepherd, and we saw that on Wednesday. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11, uh, and we've seen this before a couple of weeks before, he was portrayed as the personal loving and caring shepherd by, by, by putting us in his chest and carrying us, right? Here in Psalm 23, he is the protector and the provider shepherd. As such, he provides an arrange of countless benef benefits for his sheep. Number one, he provides food. Green pastures, which considering the geographical and topographical challenges in Israel, that was almost an impossible. Most green pastures are short-lived due to the extreme heat in most of the terrains where shepherds would like, to, would like their sheep to eat. Most of the topography in Israel is rocky, desert-like. However, every morning, the dew and the drops of water carried by the desert uh, in the, to the desert by the trade winds coming from the Mediterranean Sea create a small window of opportunities for the sheep to eat because there's a thin grass that grows there. It's enough moisture there created to help grow a thin, short-lived grass that sprouts every day. The job of the shepherd is to find such places, such limited opportunities for the sheep, the sheep to eat and enjoy drinkable water as well. That is why the sheep, uh, why, uh, you know, this is why sheep depend on trust their shepherds. As the shepherds provide food, new energy stems from the eatable plants and, uh, found on the valley floor. In spiritual terms, the shepherd's food provides a spiritual re renewal and revival, declaring the one's guilt the sinner as a righteous individual. In Romans 3.23, we read, we, all, we have all sinned, therefore we are, have fallen short of the glory of God. Hence, due to the misfortunes of our sinful lives, we often find ourselves in the valley, searching for food and water. The valley in those days was usually the place where battles took place. We can think of the valley of Jezreel who was the number one valley throughout the history of Israel where they fought all the battles right there. That was the main battlefield in Israel. And also the, va the valley of Je Jehoshaphat, which will be the, battle, the battlefield of the Armag Armageddon. Now look at the picture of the valley of Jezreel looking from the west to the east. At the end, you'll see Mount Tabor right there at the end. So it was between, this valley had Mount Tabor on the east and Mount Carmel on the west. And the valley Jezreel was right there in the middle. They call it the Valley of Megiddo. And this is where the, 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 valley, the, the valley where the Armageddon will, will be fought, according to the Bible. Ar Har Magedon means the mountain of Megiddo, which is Mount Carmel. Very interesting. In a common warfare setup, the battlefield will be located in the valley while the two armies will be settled in the two opposite mountains overlooking the battlefield. Hence, the valley is the place where personal and collective battles and struggles are fought. Hence, it is only fitting that David describes such a place as the valley of the shadow of the death. At the time of the writing of, of this psalm, Psalm 23, David found himself under persecution from King Saul. He found refuge in a deep but narrow canyon or valley called today Wadi Kelt, where St. George Monastery is found. I've been there before. It is a tiny place, but a beautiful place. This is a picture of it, the valley of the shadow of the death. And you can notice that because the cliffs are so high on both sides, uh, you, you know, the sunlight tends not to reach the bottom, the bottom of the valley of the canyon. The cliffs, uh, you know, provide this shadow throughout the most of the day. The narrow valley, just a few hundred feet on its widest point, served as a hiding place to David. The reference here to shadow or darkness, right, is due to the height of the cliffs, which on either side that prevented the sunlight to reach down. Death for David stuck him in every corner, from any, any, behind any tree, behind any bush. To him, here in the valley, death seemed imminent, looming from every angle. 
So he didn't know. He was scared because he was afraid of, of Saul killing him. You know, when we struggle in life, we feel as David felt. We feel like our life problems and difficulties have us against the wall. From financial struggles to health issues, from marital problems to children going on the wrong path, from mental, physical, and spiritual affairs that we go through. It seems like we are walking through the valley of the shadow of the death with every step we take. Nothing seems to work. Problems linger and don't go away. Labels describe you as an unfor uh, you know, your, your unfortunate situation, making you feel like a, mo a lost cause. People walk away from you because they think that you are beyond repair. And it seems that God doesn't care or he doesn't pay attention to your need. There's no answer coming from God. We're struggling. And when we struggle, it is tough. In our investigation so far, we have discovered that there's a mountain on chapter 22 of Psalm that I call the mountain of salvation. And we have discovered so far that we have a valley that I call the valley of life afflictions in Psalm 23. Now, is there then a mountain past the valley of afflictions? Is there something else beyond your suffering, beyond your misery or your pain? Let's turn to Psalm 24, and we're going to read the first couple of verses. And uh, uh, it's interesting because this text, uh, it tell, it, this text tells us about this mount. Let me read to you. Chapter 24, verses 1 and following. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded upon the seas and established, established it upon the rivers. Verse 3. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Uh-oh. Do you see the word hill? The word hill or mountain appears in Psalm 24. And who may stand in his holy place? Verse 4. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. Verse 5, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Huh. How is this mountain called? It was called the Mount of Assembly. It was called Mount Zion, the Mount of Congregation. The mount of the divine presence. The sacred mountain. According to the Bible in Isaiah 14, 13. So this mountain in chapter, tw uh, chapter 24 of Psalms is found there. So we have a mountain on chapter 22. A valley on chapter 23. And another mountain on chapter 24. This hill a mount mentioned here is a reference to the mount of assembly. Now, this mountain is all about the fulfillment of our redemption. It is uh, about God's reward for his faithful ones. It is the perfect place for those whose hands are clean, whose, who there's, they don't have any secret sin. They don't, have, they don't live any double lives. They, there's no pride in them or stubbornness or, or, or live uh, you know, their life by appearances. Their clothes have been washed with the blood of the Lamb, and now they stand victoriously right before the God of the universe. They have pure hearts. They haven't committed adultery with idols in whose lips there's only truth. Those will be the only ones blessed and vindicated according to Psalm 24. They stand before the Lord at the Mount of Assembly in top shape, in top form. Restored, totally transformed by the powerful blood of the Lamb. Many centuries before, in this same place, Lucifer stood before God. Lucifer and his followers stood before God. In the same place, at Mount Assam of the Assembly. And he stood with rebellion in his heart and his mind. He stood before his creator, before the God of the universe. 
He was not, a, he was not afraid of his, of his uh, desire to be like God. He was not afraid of his hatred toward God. He was in pure rebellion, in total rebellion uh, in front of God. In Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, we'll read of five things that were in Lucifer's heart and made him Satan. Let's read it. Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14. Verse 13. You said in your heart, number one, I will ascend to heaven. That's his first desire. He wanted to ascend to heaven. Number two, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. In other words, I'm going to be ruling over the angels of heaven that never came with me. Thirdly, I will sit and throne on the Mount of Assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. You see, he himself is calling the Mount of Assembly the sacred mountain. So he wanted to go above that. He wanted to establish his own kingdom. Number four, verse 14, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. That's a reference to Jesus Christ. You see, they are, the, all of this, I will ascend or I will rise, they are coming in, ascend, in ascending progress. The fourth one is, is against Jesus. Not the angels, now Jesus. The, one that come, the ones that come in the clouds. Now on the, number five, I will make myself like the most high. You see, that's the toughest one. That's the number one desire he had. To be like God. He was looking for God's throne. He was fighting for it. And as we unwrap this passage block, Psalms 22 through 24, we find something very interesting. Almost all of them have, have a parallelism in the Bible. Mount Golgotha, found in, in 22, chapter 22, 16 through 18 of Psalms, has its parallelism on Mount Moriah when Isaac, Isaac's life was spared and replaced at the altar by the lamb caught by the horn in the thicket. The valley of the shadow of death in Psalm 23 has its parallelism in two places. The struggles of our daily lives. And secondly, the, ultimately in the valley of Jehoshaphat well, where uh, the final decision for God will be made upon this earth. Where the battle of Armageddon will be fought according to Joel chapter 3. But then the, the third one, in the Mount of Assembly found in Psalm 24, has no precedence except that it's prophetically referred to in Revelation 15. Let me read to you Revelation 15, 1 and 2. I, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the last seven pl uh, plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. Verse 2. And I saw what it looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious. Wow, that is amazing. God's people, the faithful ones, the victorious ones, those that will go through the tribulation and at the end will be counted as, fa as, as faithful, will stand beside the sea right here right in the Mount of Assembly, right before God. So Psalm 22 through 24 encapsulates our history as human beings. From our creation to our fall. From our redemption to our glorification. It's the plan of salvation from its inception in heaven, in God's heart, all the way to its culmination when all the beings from across the universe will stand before God to witness how you and I will enter through the heavenly gates into eternity. Do you want to be there that morning? Psalm 22 through 24 makes sense geographically, topographically, philosophically, psychologically, theologically, emotionally, physically, mentally, and spiritually. I don't know about you, but I, I am under the impression that, King, that David, when he wrote about this, he knew what he was writing. He understood that this block of passages 
summarize the whole history of our earth, of our human race, and of the plan of salvation. Truly, he was being persecuted by King Saul, but David knew in his heart in whom he had believed. He knew that Jesus, his shepherd, would come through for him because he had already provided in concept through the blood of the sacrificed land that he was seeing, David was seeing, he, Jesus provided an escape and a, and a solution for him. Therefore, he could truthfully and unequivocally pronounce the following statement. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Can you repeat that statement this morning? As you struggle with whatever you're struggling with, can you say, Lord, I know that you are with me. I can feel your presence. I know sometimes I feel you know, like I need an embra embrace. I need a hug. I know you're there, Lord. And we can say this because Jesus provided. Psalm 22 through 24 truly is truly the shepherd's way. Therefore, if you are in need of redemption, see the mountain of salvation in Psalm 22, 16 through 18, where he made provision for the ransom. If you are struggling, disappointed, frustrated, abandoned, rejected, betrayed, falsely accused, in ruins, in misery, in pain, lonely, displaced, etc., 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 just remember that even though you're walking in the valley of shadow of death, he is with you. If you feel like giving up, if you think that there's no escape solution, look up to the Mount of Assembly. Look up, lift up your eyes. And you will see his eternal reward for you, just waiting for you, where there's going to be no more death, no more tears, no more pain, no more frustration and disappointments, no more sin, no more sickness, no more crimes. No more divorce, no more homelessness, no more accidents, no more unemployment, no more social distancing, no more coronavirus, no more political mess and economical mess, no more injustices, no more war or earthquakes, storms, fire, floods, you name it. I would like to leave you this morning with this passage found in Revelation chapter 22 as I close. Verses 12 through 14. Behold, Jesus says, I am coming soon. And my reward is with me. And I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. You see, as, as Psalm 22 through 24, it shows the beginning and the last and the end. That's the whole summary. It represents Jesus. Verse 14, Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life, may go through the gates into the city. Do you want one day to walk in through the gate, eternal gates? As you enter, see and hear the people talking about you. Who are these people entering into the new Jerusalem? Who are they? And Jesus himself will say, these are the redeemed. They went through the tribulation, but they remained faithful. And these are the ones that will be with me for eternity. You want to be there? Just give your heart to the Lord. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And we want to give our hearts to you, O Lord. We recognize that without you, we're nothing. As David understood it, that Everything begins with you at the cross. We understand that you died on year 31 AD. But in reality, 1 Peter says that you decide to die for us even before the foundation of this earth. It began in your heart. So Psalm 22, 16 through 18, in reality is telling us that even before our creation, you already Die for us. You already gave your life for us. You already loved us unconditionally. Help us see in this block, block, block of uh, Bible passages. See you, your redemption, 
and the willingness ya- that you have to come one day to get us and take us into heaven. I want to be there, O oh Lord. And if there's someone today that would like to be there, and in their minds right now they say, I want to be there, O oh Lord, make it happen, please. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath. Thank you for tuning in today. I would like to invite you and remind you of this Wednesday again as we study a hint of death, uh, a very interesting study of the chapters 12 through 14 of the book of John. May God bless you. Stay safe. Stay, you know, drinking a lot of water. And stay home. And may God bless you and enjoy your Sabbath. Bye-bye.